Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome back to Modern Leadership. It is so good to be with you again, and I am super excited for this week's episode. Today, we're going to be talking about leadership, titles, and being an agent of change. And our guest today to help us dive into this topic is Rick Miller. Rick is an unconventional turnaround specialist, a sought-after speaker, servant leader, and expert in driving sustainable growth. For over 30 years, he served in senior executive roles, including president and or CEO in Fortune 10, Fortune 30, nonprofit, and startup companies. Wow, really ran the gamut, including AT&T Global Services and Lucent Technologies. Throughout his career, he has been recruited from the outside to turn around poor performance, specifically in difficult times. He's the author of the new book, Be Chief. It's a choice, not a title, helping leaders achieve their potential. Rick, it's so great to have you with us today. How are you? I'm doing great, Jake. It's a great opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Well, and as I mentioned in the intro, I mean, you've really run the gamut. I mean, you've worked in big companies. You've worked in startups. You've seen all sorts of different types of leadership experiences and opportunities. Uh, But before we jump into all of that, what did we miss by way of bio that uh, give us a little background of who you are personally? Well, thanks, Jake. Thanks for that opportunity because it, it really is important to understand when you talk to anybody kind of where they come from. And sure, the titles uh, tend to get people's attention, uh, what I sometimes refer to as your LinkedIn bio, but uh, pretty significant for all of us are the things that don't show up on our LinkedIn bio. And I've got a, a quick story to, to tell you about kind of who I am, which kind of sets the stage. And it, it starts uh, where I grew up. I grew up in central Massachusetts, uh, the oldest of three boys. Uh, my dad was kind of a de facto single parent because my mom was hospitalized for most of my life. We lost her last year. But dad did a wonderful job bringing up his three boys and and teaching us about things that uh, you should do and you shouldn't do and values and morals. But I remember growing up and, and, and being struck by dad at the kitchen table at the end of a long day because he would talk about his job. Dad was in personnel before there were you know human resource executives. We called people in that department people in personnel. And dad worked in the only non-union machine tool shop in central Massachusetts. So, you know, we'd go to church, we'd see people from the union, we'd go to the grocery store, we'd see people from different unions, and, and union people are terrific. I got nothing against union people, but, but dad's job at, at his machine tool shop was to create an environment between, if you will, a, a, a communication between the workers and management so the union really wasn't needed. And, and Jake, I've got to tell you with the considerable pride of a, of a, a, of a firstborn son that in 27 years – at this particular machine tool shop, there was never even a union vote. Never even a vote. Surrounded by union shops, never a vote. So this proud son would tell you there was never a vote because they didn't need a union. They had my dad. And so if people and personnel made more money, I probably would have gone into personnel. But we didn't. We grew up lower middle class, and that was fine. Um, but the things that dad taught me, I could probably give you in four bullets, which affect every job I've taken since. Number one, he said, there's no question people with titles have power. Number two, people without titles have real power. Number three, everybody is at their best when they feel, po- feel powerful. And number four, everyone is different and they make their own choices. And this is such a great story, Rick, and I, I want to jump into it a little bit because, you know, we talk on this podcast a lot about leadership at work, leadership in our careers, leadership in business, but you started us off with leadership in the home and a story of how impactful this was. And I want to make sure that our audience, those listening, understand the important role that we play as husbands, fathers, mothers, wives in the home in teaching our children some of these leadership values and principles. And I want to dive into those four uh, principles that you talked about that your father taught you, uh, starting with leadership. Uh, it definitely starts with titles. There's, there is leadership with titles. Let's start with that. Yeah, there, there is a, you know, the term chief. And again, the title of the book is Be Chief, as you said. It's a, it's a choice, not a title. And there's no question that people are are fascinated uh, with the word chief. I know when I went to business school, I aspired 
to one day be a chief executive officer because when I got out of business school, that was the that was the uh, the ultimate. That's really where you wanted to uh, to to, uh, to reach. That was the goal. And at the time, I believed that the chiefs were the ones that had the power. Now, I at the time associated word, the word power with authority and control, and I thought that came from a position or a title. And and frankly, there, there's a sense, Jake, that from a a chief title, you've got a little bit of a superiority thing going on. If you if you you know you think about business, many times you have to go up in an organization to get a decision made because the the assumption is the people up there, those with the big titles, must be smarter, right? Must have more information. Although the people who are closest to the issues are actually on the front line, so it's kind of interesting there. But that old definition of power, that old definition of power is one that I still think uh, is is in large supply today in too many places. Yeah, as we look at corporate world today, and you're exactly right. I mean, I look at somewhat, we call it the bureaucracy of, especially as we look at larger companies of decisions that need to be made or felt like the decision needs to be made from the top. And I think sometimes this is stopping our growth because as you mentioned, you know, there's this assumption that those at the top, they're at the top because they have the information, they have the the skills or the talents necessary to make the decisions. However, those on the grassroots, those on the ground floor, the boots on the ground folks are the ones really interacting with the clients and the customers and those who really understand what's going on on the assembly line floor or whatever's going on within your business. And so, you know, do you see, Rick, this changing as we move forward? Do you see less and less of this uh, reliance on top or is it still pretty prevalent? No, I think it's, uh, I think it's going away, Jake. I would argue it's not going away fast enough. Uh, and clearly, I believe that there are organizations that are really big that, that get it. The term decentralization has been around for a long time. The question is how many organizations practice decentralization. You know, there are new terms that are out there today. People, uh, companies uh, are all focused on being agile. It seems to be the word of the day. And it's fine. Agile, you know, years and years ago uh, used to mean fast and flexible. So I, I worked in organizations, you know, a, a number of years ago that were fast and flexible. Now we call them agile. And to your to your point, I think there are more and more organizations that understand that they will not be able to to really achieve sustainable growth unless they engage all their employees. And this phrase I use is create a situation where all employees bring their A game every day. And how do we do that, Rick? Because as the company gets larger, obviously there needs to be some central clearinghouse for decisions, important decisions being made. Otherwise, anarchy, you know, runs the show. How do we start to allow, especially in a larger company? And when I say larger, let's talk actually more medium size, maybe 10 to 15, 30 uh, million dollars annual revenue. How do we uh, allow the, the 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 rank and file to have more input in some of what's going on within the business. Well, that, that's a that that is the question. Uh, it's the one that the book is dedicated to answer. Let me give you a couple of highlights because otherwise I'll keep talking and you know <laughs> it, there's a, there's a lot to it, but there's a way to simplify it. Here's the simple answer. The simple answer is those that do have titles, those do have a a a role as a manager, can make decisions, can make choices to increase the probability of their frontline workers being fully engaged. What does that look like? Focus on communication, focus on recognition, focus on particularly recognizing innovation when it comes from the front lines, right? I mean, people will, you can teach people if a great idea comes from the front line and, you know, we make a big deal about it, then other people will notice. That's a simple one. Uh, whether it's compensation or recognition or communication, uh, those are all things that management can do to increase the probability. I call that top down, and that's no surprise. But the th- the work that we do in the book is we identify that one of the most powerful levers that's not pulled by many companies yet, I think it's coming, is what I call not top down, but side to side power in- increase. And so the research that's in the book, some wonderful work is, is done by a researcher named Sagal Barsade, who's currently at Wharton. She was at uh, Yale when she did this research. But the research that Barsadi did showed that when you add an individual to a frontline group, say you've got 10 people, and an 11th comes in, that 11th person with no positional power 
has an incredible influence on the other 10. And the point we make in the book is that anyone in a team influences everyone in the team. So to create organizations where you get this, you know, everyone brings their A game, certainly there's some things that can go top down, but you've got to be very aware of the the people who are on the front lines and, and at every level because they're just as affected by their peer group as they are people who, quote unquote, have chief titles. So that's one answer. Um, and I'll stop there because I've got another one if you want me to go on. Well, before we go on, I want to ask you, so, Will, I want to make a comment, and that is that the the rank and file, those who are actually on the boots, on the ground, doing the work, they actually are ready for these opportunities. And it's important that the C-suite, those who do carry the titles, to recognize and give opportunity to everyone within the organization. I think from a perspective of top down, it starts with the top opening up the doors and providing the opportunities and really allowing allowing the people that you work with and the people you work around to really show their value to you and really prove the greatness that they have within them. I think sometimes we we underestimate the abilities and the talents and the skills of those we work around. And sometimes we take it upon ourselves to do way too much with an organization. And we'd be surprised at the value if we give people the chance to do it. Uh, So that's my one thought on that. Let's jump into this second thought that you had. Well, I think part of it is, and I agree, the top can, can certainly do things, but I, but if, if I'm on the front line right now, um, I'm not waiting, honestly, for – and this is the premise of the book. If you're in an organization, don't wait for someone to decide it's time for you to exercise, exercise your power. And this is the, the, the core of the book. We talked earlier on about the conventional view of power, authority, and control, and position, and title – In the book, I advocate a very different definition of power, which is available right now to anybody in any level in the organization. I believe that power is about energy. It's about influence. It's about clarity. It's about confidence. And it's about impact. And the premise of the book is that if you redefine power in what I would call today's language, that's what power is today, then you'll quickly understand that you have choices that you can make to choose power, not to wait for someone to give it to you. One of my favorite uh, lines is, power is never given, it's only taken. So if you're on the front line, are there choices that you could make to increase your energy? Absolutely, we offer those in the book. The same for influence and clarity and confidence and impact. These are areas where we all have choices that we can make to be the best version of ourselves. And that version of power, I think everyone can resonate with, and, and that's the kind of power we talked earlier on about, the kind of power that spreads. That's the kind of power that spreads. Well, I want to talk a little bit about this energy. You used the term a couple of times and, and help us to understand what bringing energy to the organization, bringing energy to your job really means for you know a frontline worker. Well, and this is such a critical point for, for any organization. Uh, in business, you know, the language of business is numbers. So you can go to survey after survey that will identify that between seven, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe six, seven, eight, or nine people out of ten in every organization are not bringing their A game, and and the cost to business in the U.S. alone is estimated at five hundred billion with a B dollars a year. That's the cost to business of people not being as powerful as they could be. And so my definition of chief. Right. So what is a chief if it's not a title? My belief is that a chief is someone who can connect what they do to who they are. Right. So let's break that down and go right to your energy question because that's, that's such a great question, Jake. At the end of the day, I believe that you can increase your energy not and sustain it, by the way, not by having you know, five cups of coffee when you would normally have two or not you know, pounding a five-hour energy or you know, a, a Mountain Dew, all great – brands, by the way, that's fine. But that's not the way that kind of energy I want to see increased. I believe, and and the offer that I make in the book, is that if you know yourself better, if you know who you are, then the the amount of energy that you can bring to your job goes way up because you make choices based on who you are. And in the book, we talk specifically about the choices you can make to increase your self-understanding and your insight, which is the real root of where energy comes from, the confidence of knowing who you are. And I'd be happy to share those 
those those five uh, choices right now, if that makes sense. Sure. We're working on a number of different chains here, Rick, which is what I love about the podcast. And I love this conversation of energy uh, because I think this energy is the new job security. I mean, if you want to have job security in your role, you know, you want to stand out, you want to get promotions or get raises or really do well in your job, bring this energy. So you've got five of these uh, topics that we're going to jump into now. Let's hear number one. Well, again, in terms of energy, this is, again, the key to knowing who you are. It starts with insight, knowing yourself. And that's that's who you are. That's why, you know, Jake is terrific and Rick is terrific, but they're different, right? They bring different things to the party. I don't want to be like Jake. You don't want to be like Rick. You want to be the best Jake you can be. I want to be the best Rick I can be. So I think that starts with this topic of of energy and insight. And I believe that to be the best version of myself, who I am, I have a choice about do I can I be present in the moment, right? And, and I'll, I'll clear the deck and then I'll go back to each one. Can I be present? Can I be accepting? Can I be generous? Can I be grateful? And can I be still? And here's uh, I'll go to the last first. Why is being still so important? To you'd think, boy, energy. How can how can being still give me more energy? The challenge I think, Jake, we have is there's so many voices around us, well-intentioned spouses and coworkers and 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 family and friends and the media who are all ready to to tell you what you should do or how you should be. Not understanding perhaps that the most important voice that we all need to cultivate to really listen to is our own. Once we're able to be still a little bit more each day, our ability to hear our own voice, which is the source of our energy, right? To hear what drives Jake? What drives Jake different than what drives Rick? So being still, finding some way to, to bring stillness into this absolutely noisy world that we live in, I think is critical. And this is something that we as organizations, we as individuals need to really clue in on and focus on. I think that there is a tremendous amount of lost ingenuity, lost uh, creativity that's happening because we are filling our days up. We're so busy. There's so many voices, so many noises. There's so many emails and text messages. There's so much going on that we never take time to be still, to think. We talked about being introspective, to really look in internally and find out you know, what you've got going on inside, which I think is stifling creativity. I think there's plenty more inventions and opportunities within our organizations that would happen if we could take time, pause a little bit, be still, as you talk about, and let those ideas start to germinate, start to grow, start to be produced within our, uh, our businesses. Spot on. And if you take a look at some of the companies that are most reported on, uh, the Googles, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Facebooks, um, many of those organizations are strongly recommended sh- recommending short meditation breaks during the day. Right? This may not get the, the press of, of their market cap. Right? We like to talk about numbers and financial statistics. But what's enabling those incredible numbers? These organizations are spending lots more time figuring out what will optimize – this doesn't sound like a, a term my dad would use, but it's the same thing. How do you optimize your human capital in addition to your financial capital? And companies who are clearly trying to, to, to be the, the best they can be are investing more time and sharing with their employees, hey, take a break, right? Take a break to do exactly, Jake, what you said, which is figure out how you can hear your own voice. And I don't believe in coincidence. So when you start mentioning these big names and they all have this in common, isn't this something we should be doing at every level of organization, whether we're a startup, a nonprofit, whether we're a Fortune 10, no matter what, if this is what's working, maybe we need to think about this a little bit and start to implement strategies to allow this to happen within our organizations. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, because the big guys are doing it, does that mean everybody should do it? No. By the way, there are other companies that have been doing it. They're just not going to get the visibility of the ones that we we tend to to get so much media attention. There are plenty of other organizations that are doing it probably more quietly, probably not able to get the front page of Forbes or Fortune or the the lead story on CNBC. Uh, But it's happening. And to your point earlier, it's happening more and more. Well, wonderful. Let's talk about some of these other energy uh, uh, functions here. Sure, sure. Well, the second one I'd offer is is to be present. There's a lot of great literature about being focused on what's going on now, the ability to bring yourself into any current moment, uh, not to worry about the meeting that you just walked out of 
or, or the meeting that you will walk into at the end of the day if you're at the beginning of the day. The energy of bringing your entire focus to the person who's sitting right in front of you right now, who you're conversing with, the, the, the amount of things you can learn uh, just by being fully engaged in that moment. Now, some of us are, are, are can can do that a larger part of the day. Or, you know, all of us can be present for a little bit. And, and the choice that that I offer in the book is, you know, just take a look at how present are you during the day, and could you be just a little bit more present? Could you catch yourself when you're engaged in a conversation and your mind is drifting? away from the person you're currently with. And oh, by the way, if you don't think the person that you're with senses that you're not all into the conversation, you're wrong, right? They sense it. So the opportunity to, to maximize the, the relationships and all the information that's present in any particular moment, I think is the key to energy. Another key, if you will. Yeah. And this is not just important in the business sense that we're talking about, but I also look at present and being present as really the definition of balance. And everybody talks about wanting balance between their personal life and their careers or their work life. And really, we're whole individuals. I mean, our work life, our family life, everything starts to roll together. And the idea of understanding balance within your life and within your family, your personal life and your work life is really about this being present with where you're at. And because of all the distractions, we talked about distractions in the last uh, little bit, but because of all the distractions, it's harder and harder for us to, to be present where we're at. You know, you're sitting in a board meeting and you get your phone there, you got your iPad up and you're checking your email. It's hard to be present, but this is such a key because as you mentioned, those around us can feel it. They know when we're present, they can feel the energy, you know, coming, radiating from us. And so that's a great one. Number two, what's number three? Number three is to uh, be accepting. Um, there's many people that lose energy by needlessly uh, uh, emoting about what is, right? So I, I'm a big believer. You, sometimes you have to look in the rearview mirror to figure out where you've been because sometimes history repeats itself. But the amount of emotion that goes into you know, uh, how did we get here? Not from an analytical perspective, but from a, from a, just a, a seeping of energy, right? It, if you can accept what is, you can keep your energy to fully engage in how you'd like to change the future, right? Uh, but, but to me, the ability to be accepting, uh, and by the way, link to that, I talk about in the book a little bit, is to be forgiving, right? I mean, you, if you want to hold a grudge, that's your choice. But how much energy are you losing? If you hold that grudge, by the way, one of the big challenges is to accept ourselves. Uh, how, how much energy do we waste? Say, boy, I wish I was this or I wish I was that. Or I, I mean, it just seems that being accepting, uh, while sometimes obvious, I'm not saying it's easy, by the way. And, and uh, like we said about being present, being still, the challenge is how do we help ourselves? How do we think about being accepting to be just a little bit more accepting of ourselves and our situations and hold that energy so that we can focus on changing the future? And accepting is not settling. Talk to us a little bit about that. Accepting can still be aggressive. It can still be shooting for high goals and achievement. Uh, it's it's not settling, but it's different from that. Tell us how it's different. Well, uh, it's just a great point you just made, Jake. It's not settling because settling settling is 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 focused on uh, evaluating where you are from a, uh, a lowering of expectations. You can still have high expectations. Absolutely. You can, you can shoot for really big goals, but, but don't needlessly beat yourself up or beat somebody else up about where you are today because that's not going to change anything, right? The energy I put into uh, berating myself or a colleague or a, or, or, a, or a peer about where we are, right? That's not going to, to do anything to get you towards where you want, right? It's just not. So it's not settling. You can keep, by the way, we all sometimes take two steps forward, one step back. If you take the one step back, is that failure? I don't choose to view it as failure. I choose to accept it as that is what is. I can't do anything about it. But from this position forward, how much energy can I put towards reaching that, that stretch goal? Uh, by, I, as a turnaround person, uh, I walk into businesses large and small and believe me, um, we set stretch goals all the time, right? They are not easy to attain, but we try to keep our energy focused on where we can go from where we are rather than lamenting uh, needlessly, uh, uh, you know, how did we get here? 
Yeah, this is such an important point that you brought up as I think about your career as, you know, being an outsider that's been called into these different companies that are going through specific challenges. And when you come in, you could spend your time beating everybody up with where they've been and what they've done and and the failures that they've had. But when it comes from an energy perspective, there's no benefit to that. And when it comes to, you know, giving them a firm foundation to build from and grow from, there's no benefit of that. You mentioned looking through the rear view just to know where you've been so you don't repeat yourself, but don't dwell on it. Don't get stuck staring out the rear view. I'm a big windshield person, Rick, and I love to look out the front windshield and know where I'm going. Uh, sure, you got to glance in that rear view mirror and make sure that where you've been is, you know, you're not repeating those paths or you don't have something coming up behind you that you're not ready for, but really focusing on where you're going, the direction that you're going in the future. So that's our number four. What's our, our, our number three? What's our fourth one? The fourth one is to be generous. Um, I, I believe there's just such a there's just such a a boomerang fact uh, a factor of being generous uh, with your time with people uh, the kindness that I mean the Talmud says the ultimate wisdom is kindness now, kindness and generosity I mean they're to me they're kissing cousins but the idea of being generous to model the behavior for those around you this is one thing that clearly talked about things that the that, that power that spreads when you are generous. There's no question you bring out the best in others. So sometimes it it uh, it doesn't get the kind of of, of coverage as we talk about uh, these 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 uh, these elements of energy that I think it could. So I've highlighted it. I think generosity is number four. Well, it's interesting that you say that because on this podcast we talk about this generosity all the time. In fact, one of my favorite quotes and one that probably pops up every two or three episodes is Zig Ziglar saying, you can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. If your focus is on helping people, allowing people to grow, to have the things that they need, then you can build your business. You can find the success. You can find the, the energy or the recharge or, the, or the, all the passions that you have moving forward can all be found as you're generous and out there helping other people. So I appreciate that one. Now we've talked about the five that I wrote down, insight and looking internally, presence, accepting, generosity, and stillness. But I also heard you talk about gratitude. Where does gratitude play into this? Yeah, well, again, just, just to, and again, there's a lot of things you're trying to you know, create a mental picture and, and, and visually it's hard. But again, I, at the top of the food chain, I believe that insight is at the higher level with energy. I think that you get energy from insight. And there are five ways that you get insight that brings you energy to be present, to be still, to be accepting, to be generous, and to be grateful. Right? Those are the five that give you insight. And so gratitude, uh, as you say, is, is, is not number five. It just happens to be number five on my list. Um, but, but the ability to, to understand the gifts that you've been given, to understand that no matter where you think you are, you have been blessed in so many ways. And just to think about not – I mean you could say glass half empty, glass half full. Uh, to me, that doesn't quite do it because for most of us, frankly, the glass is brimming if we choose to understand the gifts that we have. And you know, again, I, I was talking to a friend the other day, and, and he was laughing at himself uh, because he was talking uh, to, uh, to his daughter. His daughter had brought home a report card, right, early, early – uh, part of the year report card and had uh, four A's uh, and an A minus. And what was the first question? Why? Yeah. What happened there? <laughs> Rather than celebrating the gratitude of this beautiful child and all that she had accomplished and being grateful for the hard work that had gone in, we, we go right to the, to, to the A minus, right? And so much of our lives, you know, it, it's about, okay, we can identify the, the, the thing that, that is quote unquote, slightly flawed or not quite at another level, but man, it just misses the fact that you know the cup is is just over the top with so many things that we have to uh, to, to be thankful for. And I've I've worked with a, a bunch of kids. Uh, if we get to if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the broadcast. Uh, but I've had a chance to work with some wonderful special needs kids, uh, and one of the one of the incredible lessons that that they teach as you think you're there to help them is they teach you about gratitude. They teach you about the gifts that we've all been given. And, and I'll tell you what, you talk about uh, when, when you truly are grateful, do you get a boost in your energy? You absolutely do. 
Well, one of the things you said that I'm a visual person and you talk about the glass brimming and I love this idea and this visual and the thought that came to my mind is most of us, our glasses aren't big enough. We need to increase the size of our glasses because the opportunities out there for us are just uh, we're, that we're brimming right now. We need bigger glasses to consider. So I love this conversation of energy. As our time runs down a little bit, I wanted to ask you one more question. And this one has to do with earlier you talked about agility being kind of a word of the day. It's kind of a buzzword out there. Another word that we hear a lot, and I want to ask you about it in the in the scope of being chief, whether you have a title or not, and that is vulnerability. And how does vulnerability, you know, spark connection within our businesses? Oh, it's a great question. And, and in the book, I uh, uh, shamelessly steal from and give full credit to Brene Brown and some of the great work she's done. If, if, if you haven't read her book, Daring Greatly, uh, go get it, go read it. Uh, she does a wonderful job uh, of supplying information, the research that links this whole topic of vulnerability not to weakness because many people will say, oh, vulnerability, that's a weakness, when in fact vulnerability is absolutely required to display the courage that you want organizations to, 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 to display people, the power that comes from their the confidence when they're willing to, to take a risk, the confidence that, that you're separating uh, you know, the decision from the person, right? So uh, and, uh, you, can, you can perhaps not achieve something uh, if you go for it, you dare greatly, because uh, there is a vulnerability when you take a risk. But the, but the things that happen in any organization that are that, that kind of are, are double jumps, if you think about the checkers, the double jumps come when someone takes a risk, when someone chooses to, to show their vulnerability and say, I'm not sure this is going to work out, but let's go for it. And so, as again, it's, it's one of those uh, uh, positive emotions that absolutely spreads because you'll see someone up here. Again, let's forget the top down. Let's go side to side. You're working in a small work group and someone next to you says, you know what? I, I've done some research and I think this is a, this is a, a, a choice that I want to make. And, and I think this makes good sense to, to do. And, and the risk that goes with that, the vulnerability that goes with that, you know, listen, so you're not going to succeed in, in everything you do. But what Brene taught us, what she supplied us with is the wonderful information that vulnerability is all about courage. It's not a weakness. I love this. And we could go on for another hour on this episode and talk about vulnerability and the importance of it in the C-suite, in the corporate America, and in our businesses, careers, and lives. Uh, unfortunately, our time is running a little bit low, and we need to wrap this part of the conversation up and jump to our next section, which is our learning from leaders, where we add a little personal to go along with this business conversation, ask you a little questions about what's going on in your life, Rick. How does that sound? Sure. Wherever you want to go. All right. Our first question is the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table. What are you reading today? Uh, right now I'm reading When by Daniel Pink. Uh, when has uh, just recently come out. Daniel Pink is a great writer. And When is all about when you need to bring your peak performance at the right time. So he does some wonderful research and talks to professional athletes, professional musicians. What does it take for you to summon your very best effort when it matters most? It's a great book. Yeah, and he's just a great writer. We've read a bunch of his stuff here on the show and on the bookshelf. So appreciate that great recommendation. How about your personal leadership superpower? My leadership superpower is probably full body listening. And how, what, what is full body listening? I mean, it's more than just your ears. Oh, it's much more than your ears. It's using your intuition. It's watching body language. It's using every bit of, of your body to connect with someone who you are attempting to communicate with and, and giving them, we talked about being present, uh, but giving them everything you have. I mean, if, if communication is the joint construction of meaning, which is a definition of communication that I love, it says that if I'm all into a conversation, my ability to jointly create and jointly construct what, what communication is going on is incredibly enhanced. So full body listening would be my, uh, my leadership superpower. What a terrific superpower. And thank you for sharing that. Our next question is a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra that you live by. Well, I, 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 you said earlier that some keep coming up. Uh, you've certainly heard God grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change the courage to change what I can and the wisdom to know the difference. I've got it uh, here in my office. Um, uh, it's something I aspire to live every day and, and uh, it's been around for a long time, but uh, I don't know that there's any better. 
And I think this goes back to kind of that number one indicator of the energy, you know, that, that kind of starts the process that we talked about. And that is insight, you know, looking internally and really, you know, talking to yourself in truth and understanding where you're coming from and where you're going. So I appreciate that quote. Such a great one. Our final question then is the book that you most often gift to friends, family or colleagues. Oh, that's an easy one. My friend Adam Grant uh, wrote a great book called Give and Take. Uh, Adam Grant, Give and Take. Now, Adam's written a couple of other New York Times bestsellers, uh, uh, originals and some others, but uh, I think that was his first effort uh, talking about givers and takers and 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 how to succeed in life. Uh, being a giver uh, is an incredibly, by the way, research would show uh, the most successful people are givers. So Adam did a wonderful job and I gift that book all the time. And I used to say, you know, Adam's an up and comer and keep an eye out for this guy. He's going places. And I don't, I can't say that anymore, Rick, because no, you this can't. guy's gone places. This guy is, is one of the most prolific writers out there right now. He really understands what's going on in the business world. And his writing is just tremendous. It's very well researched. He's brilliant. And so I thank you for sharing that. It's, it's a book that we all should probably gift to those around us. And if we haven't read a copy, pick it up and do so. Rick, thank you for your time today before we let you go. And thank you for sharing your stories and actually really getting vulnerable. I mean, if you look back on this episode, we started with talking with your father and the lessons that you learned in what was somewhat a single household. And then you moved on and we talked a little bit about special needs children and the the value that they've brought and the lessons that they've taught into your life. Thank you for coming on and being so vulnerable, talking about this topic. Uh, Before we let you go, how can we find out more about you and any parting words of wisdom for us? Well, thanks for that opportunity, Jake. Yeah, if if you want to learn a little bit more, you can go to bechief, B-E-C-H-I-E-F.com. At bechief.com, you'll be able to to, uh, take a a free survey about how powerful you are. You'll be uh, introduced to some choices you could make to be more powerful. You'll be able to get download a free chapter of the book if you like. And, And perhaps most significantly, Jake, we didn't talk a lot about this, but you'll learn about a wonderful organization called Sammy's House, which is a special place that helps special needs kids and all author proceeds from this book are going to charity and they're all going to, to help special needs kids. And you'll be able to read about Sammy's house, uh, see some pictures of some wonderful teachers, uh, by the way, in wheelchairs who are down at Sammy's house uh, and understand that uh, uh, those who visually might not look like they are uh, at the top of anybody's list uh, can offer so much to those of us if we just go in and do some full body listening. Well, that's awesome. We're going to put that on the show notes. We're going to connect everything up so that the listeners can go to one spot and get it all. And, you know, we started out talking about how titles have power, but real power doesn't need a title. It doesn't require a title. And Rick, you've come on, you've talked about so many great things. Thank you for being this week's guest expert. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. All right, my friends, I I think I feel like a broken record sometimes. I get on these, you know, post interviews and and do a little wrap up. And I always say, that was a great episode. And I... The same thing is happening right now. I just think back of the last 30 minutes that we spent with Rick and the knowledge and the articulation and the way that he presents his message was just so well done. There's so many actionable things in there. We only got into one aspect of this entire book and that is the energy. And we were able to walk through, you know, these different triggers, these different ways to generate the energy within ourselves. And you know me, I'm a big believer in bringing your energy your A game to everything that you do, particularly when we're talking about, you know, the work that we do our, in our careers. And so everything that we talked about, including how to connect with Rick, will be found on the show notes for this episode. And that will be found at jakeacarlson.com slash ml96, episode 96. And until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days, an even better life, Make sure you introspectively focus on the energy that you have and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. 
You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Oh,